St. Augustine offers a helpful explanation for why good and miraculous things sometimes happen to God's people. Since people can and do become used to everything that happens, and all things come to make less and less of an impression on them, God in his mercy causes some things to happen outside of the natural run and order of events, so that those who have grown used to everyday things and have lost sight of their value will wonder at the sight of things which may not be great, but which are indeed unusual. Today we're talking about idolatry and we're talking about God's provision for his people. I'm Joel Miller. And I'm Jamie Bennett. And this is Bad Books of the Bible. It's a podcast about a collection of books with a curious pedigree and an even stranger legacy. In our last episode, we closed by saying that we were going to get more of the same in this <laughs> in this uh, right. in this episode, and and that's kind of true. There, you know, we're back to idolatry. The the author is not done with idolatry. Um, this is a big deal for him. It should be a yeah. big deal for us. Uh, certainly it's a big deal to understand what he's trying to say. And so I thought, why don't I just ask Jamie, could you give us a quick summary of kind of like where he's gone with idolatry so far so we can pick it up having that in mind? Yeah, I think it's important to remember that, first of all, it's not just a free flow of thought. He's not just saying everything that comes to mind over the course right. of many chapters. Uh, he's been building an argument. And of course, you know, we saw early on he was, uh, you know, building a case for what wisdom is and how we obtain it. But then he's turned uh, to history, uh, to redemptive history, and particularly to a critique of idolatry while he's doing it. So mm -hmm. he looks at the history of God's people as laid out in scripture, and he contrasts that over and over again with the futility of idolatry. Yeah. And one of the arguments he seems to be making is that, you know, God's justice is ultimately going to prevail in the end and that idolatry and evil behavior and anything that we do that might mislead or or uh, bring others off the path. Uh, these things are a dead end. Yeah. And, and that ultimately it is God in his providence and in his justice that will prevail. And that's where we start then in chapter 15. It, let me just read a couple of verses here. But you, our God, are kind and true, patient, and ruling all things in mercy. For even if we sin, we are yours, knowing your power. But we will not sin, because we know that you acknowledge us as yours. For to know you is complete righteousness, and to know your power is the root of immortality. So, God is the very source of life and we have allegiance to him. And by that allegiance to him, we gain life. Yeah. And one of the things that is kind of an undercurrent of his argument all along is that in these two ways that he's describing, wisdom is life, leads to life. Uh, folly leads to death. Right. He talks about by envy, death entered the world. And here we have the the whole idea of like uh, allegiance to God is life, whereas idolatry is death and lifeless. And you'll see this metaphor of lifelessness around around idols come up throughout this whole chapter. Yeah. Well, and I, I think it's also interesting that uh, in verse two, when he says that knowing your power, we will not sin. Now, of course, mm -hmm. we all sin. And uh, how many times have we, you know, we spent our morning praising God and then we go out and forget all about it in our behavior. Sure. But but the point still stands because it's it's almost as if like knowing our place in the world, knowing to whom we belong, like that this is a great motivator to turn from sin and to the source of life, to God himself. Right. Well, that's exactly it, because we are being called back to that in this. Yeah. So the, the whole idea there and, and we know this as Christians who must regularly confess you know, if it were a one and done thing and we never sinned again, that might be interesting, <laughs> but that's sure. not normative. And so this this little verse here is reminding us of of why we strive not to sin. And of yeah. course, the fact that we trust God to to forgive us also. Yeah. And, and that God is actively involved uh, mm -hmm. and that in our striving to know God, that um, 
that we that we can know God, right? And that, right. that he is going to be present within uh, in his goodness, within yeah. our uh, attempts at faithfulness. Yeah. So there's a, a very interesting line that comes after this uh, in verse four. For neither has the evil intent of human art misled us, nor the fruitless toil of painters, a figure stained with varied colors whose appearance arouses yearning in fools, etc. He's talking about idols and idol makers. Yeah. And what's interesting about this is he is saying, as Jews, we're not given to idols, which mm-hmm. is fascinating because, you know, there's the whole Old Testament that would argue that that's not the case. <laughs> and and what's what's happened here is there is a shift that has happened in the worship of Israel really since the since the exile in which going away into captivity was in a sense refining and the idolatry and all of that that ended up causing the exile in the first place is kind of like purged out of Israel so when they come back into the the land they are not worshiping idols any longer they are worshiping right. the one true god they are dedicated to his word they are gathering in the temple and the synagogue to worship him and their their religion is now changed which i find utterly fascinating and here's a yeah. testament to that right here right well it, it reminds me of how saint paul calls the law like a taskmaster like yeah. it's an instructor who teaches us so yeah. it's not that uh by simply being jews who follow after god that they have it all together Right. Um, but they have to be taught. They have to be instructed of of the line. That schooling is, you know, it bears fruit because the the author here says that they're not fooled by idol makers any longer. Right. Mm-hmm. And I wanted to come back to something that we've tried to do throughout this whole presentation of the wisdom of Solomon, which is to not other the fool, but rather recognize that sometimes we can be the fool, sometimes recognize that we are the unjust, use the book as a mirror to say, where are we falling short? And this happened to coincide this episode with my reading of Arthur C. Brooks's uh, book, From Strength to Strength. And there's a passage in that book where he talks about the four idols that Aquinas mentions in one of his books. And those four idols are these money, power, pleasure, and honor. Mm -hmm. And it's easy when you read about these idols, you know, they're, they're painted, they're this figure of, you know, like a frog or, you know, whatever beast. (laughs) Um, You just imagine like this garishly painted, ugly thing. And you're like, never would I do that. But money, power, pleasure, honor. Yes. I actually have many idols (laughs) and, and, they're there. And if I were if I were reading this book the way it's intended to be read as a as a mirror, as something to to not only encourage me to to follow and, and be more closely allied with God, pursue union with God, but rather to reject also those false gods in my life, money, power, pleasure and honor are a pretty great summation of what they might be. That actually sounds like a rap song. Money, 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 power, power, power. <laughs> But the, these are the things that, like that's why this book it, I I think is so uh, so relevant even today. Yeah, because we're talking about something from a very long time ago. You're bringing in Aquinas from uh, more recently, but still a very long time ago. And yet, this is still the stuff that enamors us, right? That attracts us and calls us away from the true path uh, to God. Well, it's interesting. I find that comparison between the faithfulness now of the Jews and our lack of faithfulness, the author is saying, hey, we are sold out to Yahweh. We are no longer worshiping idols. That's not us. We are are true believers. We are following steadfastly the path. And then it's very easy for Christians since the coming of Christ now to kind of look at Jews as having, you know, like totally missed it, and, and they're not faithful. And if they were, they really would have seen it all, and it's, et cetera. And there can be this othering thing where we sure. kind of like, where, we, where we're judging or looking down our nose or whatever. But to bring those four idols of Aquinas into view suddenly, realize, suddenly makes clear that, no, actually, I'm <laughs> fooled by idols all the time. Yeah. And I have no place to judge anybody else. Yeah, no, that's absolutely right. 
So speaking of fools, here is the guy that makes an idol out of clay. Tell me, Jamie, what can we learn about the foolish potter? Well, it's it's interesting because this uh, this metaphor, this word picture, comes up in scripture, you know, multiple times, mm-hmm. and it's not always negative. Actually, I mean, the, the the potter and the clay, like God, the the idea can be that God is shaping the potter and the clay uh, mm-hmm. into for the purposes uh, that that He wants. But the idolater does this too. And yet the difference is, you know, God has the power of life and, and God can truly create, whereas the potter is simply taking, uh, you know, he's taking dust that's mixed with water and he's forming it into something. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, the, it's interesting, the, the language of the sarcasm, I suppose, in this text. Uh, verse yeah, it's, sar- it's sarcastic for sure. Very much so. And verse 10 says, his heart is ashes. His hope is cheaper than dirt. You know, this is a word play because of the clay. Right. And he's forming this idol out of just mere dirt. And it reminds me of when we were talking about before, I think it was last time, uh, Isaiah 44's critique of Mm -hmm. idolatry. These idol makers are deluding themselves. They're deluding their customers. Um, you know, you, you make an idol out of wood, it can be thrown into the fire, right? you know, and it becomes ash. It's not any, what, and what help is ash going to be? Right. You know, so it, it's, it's essentially saying this is completely worthless. It's a lie. It's, it's just dirt. It's not valuable. And what's interesting there is the comparison then to humans, right? Because humans yeah. are also made of clay as mm-hmm. the scripture talks about. And yet, they're alive. They have the breath of life. It talks here about like a borrowed spirit or a borrowed soul that a human has. Whereas Mm -hmm. that, that thing made that the human made is not even alive. So it has no, it has no value. The value for the human is that we are inspired by God, that we're made in his image and given the breath of life. Whereas a human goes and makes a, a figurine and that figurine has no life. There is no breath in it. And you end up like worshiping something that's worthless. Right. Yeah, it, exactly. Uh, you know, Ecclesiastes comes to mind here. You know, mm-hmm. in chapter five, verse seven says, the dust returns to the earth as it was, and the spirit returns to God who gave it. This is not much different than verse eight, where it says, after a little while goes to that from which he was taken when he is required to return the soul that was lent him. You know? Yeah, and- Interesting. And, and, and then it also goes on to talk about the idols, uh, how, how pointless they are. I mean, I love that it said the feet, like if assuming the idol has some, some tootsies on there, you know, some toe yeah. feet, their feet are of no use for walking for right. a human being made them. And one whose spirit is borrowed, formed them for no man can form a God that is like himself. Yeah. We just wow. can't do it. No. <laughs> It's like you can only create something inferior to yourself. And yeah. if you're if whatever you make is inferior to yourself, then if you would turn your affections toward it, you are automatically giving your affections towards something that is not worth the affection. Yeah. yeah. Augustine says that very thing in a passage where he's he's commenting on this. He says, Worship one who is superior to you, that is, one who created you. It would be an insult to you if someone considered you as equal to that object that you have made, which is totally true. Yeah. I mean, I am more than my work. Why would I worship my work? Right. Right. And I would consider it offensive. And certainly, like, you can actually take this right into the modern workplace where people feel like their only value is the product that they make. They, they, they're offended by that. You know, they're like, I'm worth more than this. They know that. Right. They leave those jobs when they have that experience. Yet we act that way in our own worship. We objectify the things that we make and turn our affections to them. Right. Yeah. I mean, at the heart of this is that we don't own our own lives. Right. It's borrowed, right? To use that very word. I love that. Yeah. From birth to death, it's borrowed. Yep. Yep. Yeah. So Augustine goes on. He says, yet you adore what you would abhor to be. In other words, like an animal, 
he's you know making a figurine of an animal sure and adorning it you become in some way similar to that object not of course changing into wood and ceasing to be a person but rendering in your interior person almost similar to the bodily effigy that you have made which is a really shocking and horrifying thought yeah the idea that we become what we worship so therefore like oh there's gosh. a really ugly choice here for us. You can either choose yeah. to follow God and therefore be conformed to his image, or you can choose to worship something else and be conformed to that image. Like Kurt yeah. Vonnegut said, uh, we are what we pretend to be. So be careful what you <laughs> pretend to be. It's the same idea. We will by, you know, if it's money, power, pleasure, honor, that's going to, that's going to contort us into the ugliest version of those things. And that will be us if that's what we worship. Yeah. Isn't that amazing that we become like what we worship, like what we honor? You know, yeah. it's, it's often said uh, that you become, I, I think like leadership peer, uh, gurus say this, leadership people say this, you become the five people you spend the most time with. Yeah. Uh, but you also become like that which you worship. Yeah. And that which we devote our time and our honor to is going to shape us and mold us into, like we're talking about with this clay, shape us and mold us into the image of what we're worshiping. Yeah. Affections are formative. Yeah. yeah. Affections yeah. are formative. They, they will change you. Just a side note, by the way, you know, we got wisdom, chapter 15, verse 7, a potter needs the soft earth and laboriously molds each vessel for our service, fashioning it out of the same clay, both the vessel that serves clean uses and those for contrary uses, etc. That is directly parallel in Romans chapter 9, verse 21, where Paul makes the same analogy. He's obviously using it for different ends. Yeah. But the fact that the analogy is so close to hand and we've already seen how much he has borrowed from the wisdom of Solomon elsewhere in Romans yeah. makes, makes that borrowing even more evident. This is a word picture that he picks up in the wisdom of Solomon and employs in Romans. He uses it in a different way, but this is the bucket that he drew it from. Yeah, absolutely. And, and in this place, uh, it's definitely a critique. And mm -hmm. that, so it's, it's not just the imagery. Because like I said, there's Potter imagery all over the Old Testament, yeah. but he is using it for a specific critique. And that is definitely going on in wisdom. So now the author shifts into a series of, we could call them juxtapositions, mm -hmm. comparisons. Um, he's got basically a handful of these that we've already experienced a couple of them, but we're going to, we're going to get into more of them here. Um, the i I'll just list the three that we're going to talk about and then we'll kind of unpack them each. Okay. The first is the frogs and the quail. The next is the locusts and the bronze serpent. And then the third will be the hail and the manna. So, yeah. You know, in, we're in the context of the Exodus. If we remember the the storyline so far, God has delivered his people and the deliverance is going to show this stark comparison between what happens. Again, these are the two ways, right? You follow God, you're going to get the quail, you're going to get the bronze serpent, you're going to get the manna. You go yeah. the other way, you're going to get the frogs, the locusts, <laughs> and the hail. And And so these things are being held in tension to show that there is that there's a right way and a wrong way. There's a, there's a prudent way and an imprudent way. There's a righteous way and an unrighteous way. And, and the author is just like holding up like these case studies almost right. of, yeah. of like, of following God or not. Yeah. I think it's interesting here that even though, because we're biblically literate to some extent, we, we understand he's talking about the Egyptians and the Israelites. Right. But he doesn't call them out. He kind of universalizes it. So when yeah, it's the same thing that he does earlier where he leaves off the names of the of the patriarchs. Yeah. It's like you have to know this material, but that also means that you can identify with those people also. And that's right. what's happening here. 
Exactly. So instead of being particularized with the Egyptians, he talks about the ungodly or those men. Or yeah. Uh, and when he talks about the Israelites, uh, you know, say he's addressing God, he says your people, your sons, right? So so the contrast becomes something universal that we can connect with. And I think it's also worth mentioning, we haven't used this word in a while on this show, but we talk about the concept of a Jewish midrash, yeah. where there, you're essentially taking uh, you know, a, a piece of scripture and offering an explanation, a further uh, deep dive into it, so, so to speak, to you know, kind of go into some detail. Mm-hmm. Um, wisdom, Imaginatively even, you know, like. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So wisdom, that's what wisdom's doing here. Um, you know, it's not necessarily just a historical exposition. It's it's taking a thoughtful look, uh, a poetic look even, um, at this event. Um, mm-hmm. So I think it's worth taking just a quick second to take a look back. I mean, uh, Numbers 21, we see Israel rebelling against God. They're causing all kinds of trouble from Moses. They're rejecting God's provision for them in the form of heavenly manna. You know, we, we, so we want to have these things in mind. There's a, you know, there's snakes coming. It's a bad time. God mm-hmm. is providing like an out. Um, yep. Despite the faithlessness of God's people, despite their grumbling, he still provides an out and they get this bronze serpent to look to for deliverance. And it provides healing if they're bitten. Mm-hmm. Right. So this difficult moment in the life of Israel, you know, ultimately does provide for their deliverance. And then it's held in contrast to the destructive things that, that occur to the faithless Egyptians. Yeah. And, and there's almost a reciprocity there. Like you, yeah. you, you gave the three categories you went, you get this or you get that. So frogs and quail, what, what's up with that? <laughs> well, you know, the, the, what's interesting, cause this is all tied back to idolatry, right? So the, the author is, is saying things like, you know, you worship these, these images of animals that you've made. Mm-hmm. Well, you're going to be destroyed by the same animals. And yeah. so he looks at the frogs that are uh, visited in the plagues on Egypt during the, uh, during the Exodus. And then he contrasts that with the quail, which are given to God, uh, God's people as, as sustenance. Mm-hmm. I really love the fact though, that you highlighted that this is midrash. This is a kind of commentary yeah. on that story. And I think we're we're free to recognize that a midrash has an interpretive point. It's a it's you being sure. used as an argument. Yeah. And so there's a like a polemical value in the way he he positions these things because if you recall back, you know, like the Israelites are griping and complaining and it's like fine, here's some quail. You know, like <laughs> It's actually the story does not show up as the Israelites are these like enlightened, holy people pursuing wisdom and therefore God blesses them with quail. This is a provision of God's in their disobedience. This is a provision of God in their unrighteousness. So it actually it shows forth the mercy and the patience and everything of God, even all the more so when you read it through the lens of the way those two passages work together. Yeah. But here, the author is, he's not dwelling on that. The reader would know that, though. And the reader would know, based on all of the things he's said so far about God's mercy and his long suffering and all of that, that that's baked into the idea that this is a gift, that the quail were a gift. They were not a reward. This was grace. This was mercy. Yeah. Yeah. But, and nonetheless, though, in that mercy, there's a contrast. Yeah. Because... The Egyptians are going hungry. You know, I don't right. I don't know if it's an issue of, you know, frogs in the mixing bowl or or what's going <laughs> on. But, uh, you know, it's definitely being set beside here are the Israelites, you know, dining on fine quail. Right. Um, and and the locusts, of course, which are the, in the next comparison, sure. certainly would have done some damage to uh, the crops that would have suddenly now been eaten by them instead of humans. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and and in that case too, I mean, you you still have this uh, locust and bronze serpent. You got the insects essentially killing uh, the the Egyptians, and the bronze mm-hmm. serpent is delivering them. It's saving them yep. from, from death. Well, and what's said there is interesting too. That God allows, because like you know, the the Israelites were attacked by these by these snakes, by these serpents. 
And yeah. yet even the attack of the serpents was part of God's mercy because yeah. there's a, an assumption that without some of these chastisements, they lose sight of God. They, they stop attending to him. They stop paying attention yeah. to him. And so God reminds them of who he is and what he's doing for them. And the, the serpent, the bronze serpent becomes that for them, a reminder of, of God's mercy and his grace. I thought there was an interesting bit of interpretive uh, understanding in the Jewish annotated Apocrypha. Uh, to the question of why a serpent, there's a footnote in there that says the Israelites complain about heavenly manna, unlike the yep. serpent who does not complain about eating dust. Which, and I mean, yes, <laughs> what's fascinating about that connection is that the, the, the manna is compared to dust. Yeah. Yeah. You know, when it's first described, that's how it's described. It's like, what is this stuff? It's like this dust on the ground. Yeah. yeah I want to also share from Psalm 107. Uh, there's there's this great text where it says, Some were fools through their sinful ways, and because of their iniquities suffered affliction. They yeah. loathed any kind of food, and they drew near to the gates of death. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. He sent out his word and healed them and delivered them from their destruction. You know, that's what's going on here, essentially. It wasn't that the Israelites were fully righteous and there's this huge, obvious contrast of, uh, you know, this these glorious people who've got it all together. Right. And then the baddies over there. No, rather, they they were near death and they were foolishly in their sinful ways, but... They cried to the Lord, and it was in that crying out that he delivered them. Yeah, again, all of this is done in the context of God's mercy. This is the two yeah. ways, you know, like good things follow from following God, but they're not they're not rewards for. They are just part of because God is merciful and good and kind and, and provident. Yeah. He gives his people what they need. So the comparison between hail and manna, let's dig into that one for a little bit. I think there's okay. there's a lot here, actually, in the way the wisdom of Solomon talks about the manna. Yeah. Well, I, I think the first thing that jumps out is that they both come from the sky, right? Uh, yep. Hail is falling from the sky, much to their chagrin and destruction. Yeah. Uh, whereas... Hail and thunderbolts. Like, I mean, this is lightning and hail. It's a It's like... This, the, it's a cataclysm falling from the sky. You know, it's like fire and ice together at the same time. Yeah. I mean, it's definitely a Bohemian Rhapsody moment, you know, thunder and lightning. Very, very frightening, you know. Very, very. Uh, <laughs> but but the manna is different. The manna is provisioned. The manna is falling from the sky. Um, you know, it's described in Exodus as tasting great like wafers with honey. And that taste of honey is like a foretaste of the land of milk and honey, right? So the yeah. the manna in the wilderness is actually a reminder of the paradise to come, of the of the good things to come. It is a yeah. it is a token of the greater gift still on its way. Right. And it's it's an ongoing sign of the goodness of God. Yeah. Well, so there's okay, I got a lot on this and I just <laughs> I'm not even sure how to unpack it exactly, but let's Let's just try a little bit. So let, first, let's read the passage, and then we'll get into it. So it says, instead of all those things, that is the lightning, the, the thunder, the hail, all the nasty from the sky, the wisdom of Solomon says this, instead of these things, you gave your people food of angels, and without their toil, you supplied them from heaven with bread ready to eat, providing every pleasure and suited to every taste. For your sustenance manifested your sweetness towards your children, and the bread ministering to the desire of the one who took it was changed to suit everyone's liking. Mm. So there is so much in that. Let's just look at a few pieces of this. Okay. The first is the the bread of heaven, the 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 food of angels. Yeah. This is a reference here in the Old Testament to something that will possibly shock an Old Testament reader. 
who who anticipates that only the New Testament could communicate these things quite as clearly as as the New Testament does. Mm-hmm. Philo of Alexandria compared the manna to the logos. He said that the manna itself was God. Okay, like this is a this is a gift of the substance of God Himself. Wow! And when you think about what Christians know as the Eucharist, we talk about that as the bread of angels. We talk about that as the the heavenly bread. We know from John chapter six that this is the bread of life. Like this is, that's what we connect all this to. The author of the wisdom of Solomon is doing the very same thing. Yeah. He is saying that this is a, uh, like part of God that we are getting yeah. in, in the reception of the manna, a part of it, a participation with, uh, with God. Now, this is made even clearer in some of the words used. Translated here in the NRSV is for your sustenance manifested your sweetness. However, that word is actually better translated your substance Mm. and the substance of God that is. And if you go back and look at other commentators on this, they are referring to the same thing. In Victor Avita's translation he or the the translation of his commentary on this he says this you in fact showed us your being and your sweetness that you have towards your children so that's his version of this verse mm-hmm. your being and that is seems to be exactly what is said here it is like a bit of a leap in terms of the interpretive reach but philo of alexandria that is to say not a Christian, a right. Jewish interpreter of the scripture, read that as the Logos, read that as what we would say is Christ, the word of God. Yeah. Beyond that, if you then jump into the New Testament where these themes will connect and you connect it to something like the Lord's Prayer, when Christ talks about, give us this day our daily bread, that adjective daily was rendered by Jerome in the Vulgate as super substantial. So that idea of mm-hmm. substance, again, is present here. The super yeah. substantial bread. In other words, it's not give us this day our daily bread. You know, there may be a lot of good things about the message as a translation or a paraphrase of the scripture, but its rendering of the Lord's Prayer is not the best. When it says, <laughs> you know, like give us three squares a day, that's not what... Th- there is nothing in the Lord's prayer that is about giving us three square meals a day. It is about the, it is about the food of angels. It is about the manna. It is saying, give us your super substantial bread. Give us you. That is what's being said. Yeah. Well, and I, I, I think it's interesting that you, you brought up Philo because certainly, you know, this is, this sort of language is used elsewhere in scripture. You know, Psalm 78 calls it the bread of the angels. Mm -hmm. Psalm 105 calls it bread from heaven in abundance. Mm -hmm. Um, but what does Jesus say? Jesus calls his flesh, the true bread from heaven in John 6 32. So it's not really surprising that Christians since the very beginning have kind of seen in this, uh, in this language and in, in the provision of manna in the wilderness as, uh, as ultimately Eucharistic that, that exactly that the Eucharist is manna from heaven, that the Eucharist is essentially angelic food. If you recognize that participation in the life of God is the source of life, which is what the book has been telling us, that is all the more underscored by this very point. Yeah. The, the Israelites sustenance, their ability to live in the wilderness in their sojourn was to participate in the life of God through manna. And that is what the life of the Christian is to have life is to participate through the life of God, through the Eucharist. And they are the same thing. Yeah. And, and this is why St. Paul says in first Corinthians 10, when he talks about the rock, he says Mm -hmm. that they all drank the same spiritual drink. They long, they drank the water that flowed from the spiritual rock that went with them. And that rock was Christ. 
God gives of himself to grant life to his people, when people choose not God, when people choose to pursue instead the things that they make themselves, when they give their affections to their own creations, they are then participating in death. They're emulating something that is not alive, that has no ability to give life. And there is a verse in chapter 16 that just brings that line or that idea into one line, which I think is really powerful and ultimately points us to the resurrection, which is a beautiful thought, but it's this, you lead mortals down to the gates of Hades and back again. Well, yeah, because God is, is the only one who has ultimately the power of life. Mm -hmm. I mean, the next verse says a man in his wickedness kills, but he cannot bring back the departed spirit or set free the imprisoned soul. That's God's job. That's what God can do. And, you know, we keep jumping from this text to the New Testament, but that's also what Jesus Christ did. Yeah. When, when Christ died on the cross and descended into death itself, into the grave, he didn't just go into a physical tomb. He also went into the heart of death, which right. is Hades. He went to hell, essentially. And from there conquered hell and made it right. possible for us to return from hell and and turn to life ultimately. He cracked Hades wide open and set the prisoners yeah. free. You know, you just said we keep bringing this to the New Testament. How could you not? I think one of the things that's so great about the wisdom of Solomon as a book is it's it is like right there, you know, it's in the Old Testament, so to speak. Um, for some readers, they may not regard it as part of their Old Testament. You know, it's going to sit there sure, maybe sure. In, in the Apocrypha for them, whatever. It is of that time, but it is so thoroughly New Testament in its in its viewpoint. It is so thoroughly New Testament in its uh, verging, like it's on the edge of moving right there, that it is, the, in many ways, the perfect transitional book to go from the old to the new, because it anticipates so much of what's in the new. You know, like when you think about those references to manna in the Psalms, so this book is here now going back to the Exodus. It is going back to the Psalms, but at the same time, it's looking forward to the Lord's Prayer. It's looking forward to John chapter Mm -hmm. 6. Somehow or another, this book in God's providence is just sitting right there as the bridge between the old and the new, as the in many ways, an interpretive lens for both the old and the new. Chapter 16 concludes with this. One must rise before the sun to give you thanks and must pray to you at the dawning of the light, for the hope of an ungrateful person will melt away like wintry frost and flow away like wastewater. St. John Chrysostom says, No one has done more so that we might be good, great, and thankful in everything than God who created us. The hope of the ingrate is like winter frost, it says. It dulls the soul and makes it die just like the body. This is born of arrogance and from believing oneself to be deserving of something. The contrite person, however, will give thanks to God not only for blessings, but also for what seems to be against him. And when he suffers, He will not think himself to have suffered unjustly. We too, then, the more we embrace virtue, the more we will humble ourselves, because virtue consists above all in this. And the more you listen to this podcast, the more you're going to want to share it with a friend, post it hourly to your social media profiles, or leave a glowing review at your podcast platform of your choice. Bad Books of the Bible is a look at some books from the Old Testament that sometimes get neglected or forgotten, and we have a whole bunch of tools to bring them to mind over at badbooksofthebible.com, including an email list with fancy facts, basics, and other tidbits about each episode. Subscribe today if you desire intellectual quail to satisfy your spiritual appetite. I'm Jamie Bennett. And I'm Joel Miller. You've been listening to Bad Books of the Bible, a production of Ancient Faith Radio. Come back next week when we explore the Pillar of Fire.